Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Duggan, and welcome to The Fix, the podcast all about Lightroom, Photoshop, and post-processing. In this episode, I want to delve into what I like to call the Lightroom-Photoshop connection, that conduit that runs between Lightroom and Photoshop that makes it easy to round-trip your files between the two applications and take advantage of the strengths that each program has to offer. So before we get into all the nuances of the Lightroom Photoshop connection, and there are many, we have some breaking news here at the Fixed Desk. And here to talk about that with me, we have a special guest, the man behind the curtain at This Week in Photo, Mr. Frederick Van Johnson. Hey, Frederick. Hey, man. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm excited to talk about these changes. And that's that's the thing about the internet, right? There's always always changes. Indeed, as as David Bowie said, ch- 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 changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, that's good. And so, and I think on what was it, the last episode of the Fix, uh, Jan came on uh, her show slash now your show to discuss these changes. <laughs> and in a nutshell, Jan is now part of uh, Adobe. So she's joined Adobe Systems and is as a full-time employee and is doing some really cool stuff over there, which we're all happy for her over here. So that's, uh, that's, the big, that's one of the big changes, right? That, yeah, that's definitely a, a major change. Yeah, so she, she uh, spread the news that uh, she is um, joining Adobe Systems. She's going to be working uh, with the Adobe Learn team, and she's going to be responsible for creating and curating uh, tutorials and educational content uh, in support of Photoshop, Lightroom, and their uh, their mobile imaging app. So um, I think that it's a totally a perfect fit for for Jan and her skill set. And uh, Adobe's lucky to have her. Totally, totally. And you know the the what is the, the is it the third law of of thermodynamics that states energy just you know it doesn't dissipate it just moves from one state to another so we lost Jan's energy but Adobe gains Jan, Jan's energy but as a result of us losing Jan's energy we get your energy on <laughs> to twip so the, inter, the the universe corrects itself right <laughs> yeah it's it's all it's all finding balance it's finding balance so yeah that that's the the ramification of Jan uh, moving on to Adobe is that I'm going to be taking over the reins here at The Fix, and I'm very, very excited about that, and uh, thank you for that that opportunity. Um, it's It was sort of fortuitous that uh, uh, in, in the last several weeks, Jan asked me to come on and kind of serve as a guest co-host to uh, help out while she was doing some travel. Um, and then in the middle of all that, Adobe called her up, and boom! changes <laughs> it's weird how it happened because we had no plans to do this right we had and in fact you wow. agreed you agreed to step in for jan like you said while she was traveling and jan being jan being as meticulous as she is and you know doing things methodically with a lot of forethought trained you on how to step into her shoes and make sure the show kept on with with no glitches Little did right. we know that she was training her successor. <laughs> yes, yes. yes, that was her her cunning plan, her like master of the universe plan there. But uh, no, yeah, she was great about, I mean, she's made it so easy for me to just sort of slide in and, and take over. And, you know, there's still things that I'm learning about how things work behind the scenes and everything like that. But uh, uh, it, it really has been a pleasure and, and very easy to kind of just slide right into it. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to building on the really great foundation that, that Jan put together for this show. Um, you know, she's been doing it, I think for about nine months or so. Is that how long it's been on? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Just about nine yeah. months. Yeah. So, um, and, and I, I think that it, it is an, an excellent foundation and, um, uh, definitely going to continue with a lot of, um, the, the, the great format, uh, changes and stuff that she implemented, but I also have some ideas, Uh, on my own in terms of, well, you know, how can we take this and and maybe uh, present information and knowledge and uh, just cool material to uh, listeners and viewers in in a different way. Totally. Yeah. And that's what excited me about this is 
you know, podcasting is a, is a personal medium, right? For the, for the host and the listeners, because it's one of those mediums where you're literally in the ear of the person every week or every episode and no other medium is, is quite that intimate, but with that intimacy, it, it becomes personal. So for, you know, as we thought about you taking over the show and what the show might manifest as, it, it would be a disservice to both you and the listeners for us to continue and try to force fit you into what Jan built, you know, but if we take, like you're saying, we take the format that Jan put together and build on that and add the Sean flavoring to it, it becomes something entirely new and, you know, even, even more compelling. So I think that's, that's where I was thinking about the whole thing. It doesn't necessarily need to be like, you know, Sean is replacing Jan on this. It, this is almost a rebirth of the fix with a whole new kind of methodology and mindset. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a really interesting opportunity, and I and I view it as a uh, a creative opportunity to work with the you know the the medium that is podcasting and uh, you know screen sharing and recording and and obviously we have you know certain limitations sometimes since we're doing this over the internet and you know based on whatever the platform is that we're using to to do the conversation back and forth. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of, of possibilities for, for trying out new things and uh, maybe even getting out of the studio, as it were, and maybe you know, recording some segments um, partially on location to kind of liven things up. So those are, are some of the ideas that I have in mind. Yep. Yeah, I think that would, those are I'm excited to see the out of the studio stuff, you know, and see how all that all that comes together. Uh, yeah, because, you know, we're on the Internet and we have smartphones and all these crazy devices. So what's to say that we have to lock ourselves down and be behind the desk? Exactly. You know, and the webcam and all that. Our phones have webcams on them and there's a wide world out there. Show us you capturing content and then bring that content in and do cool stuff with it. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, I, I, w w one aspect of the show that, that will stay the same is that I am going to continue to do the, the sort of uh, interview or guest format where we have a guest come on and show something that they are uh, an expert in. Uh, I think that that is a really great way to bring in, you know, new voices and different voices who can uh, share things that, you know, maybe I don't do or I'm not that good at. And it gives us a, a much broader range of topic material to work with. But, um, you know, for some topics, I might be able to just sort of do it myself uh, on my own, which is what I'm going to be doing with this episode here. And um, there's also that possibility, uh, as I mentioned, of, you know, for, for shows like that is maybe... Uh, do part of it out in the field where I'm talking about, you know, I'm shooting this picture in a certain way because I know I'm going to do X, Y, Z to it once I get it back into Photoshop. So we'll, we'll set up the shot and then we'll go back in and work with it in Photoshop. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited, man. It's going to be a good show. Cool. Well, excellent. I'm looking forward to moving forward uh, with that. And uh, thanks for, for coming on here to uh, uh, talk with us about it. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity, and uh, and also all the other great uh, podcasts and content that's available at thisweekinphoto.com. You're welcome. You're welcome, man. Thanks for thanks for having me on now your show. <laughs> cool. All right. Take care, and uh, we'll we'll see you on the internet. Okay. With the breaking news segment out of the way, it's time to turn our attention to the main topic for this episode which is the Lightroom Photoshop connection and round-tripping files between those two programs. Before we dive into Lightroom and Photoshop and start bouncing back and forth between the two programs, I want to address a basic workflow question regarding when you should be applying adjustments in Lightroom versus when you should be applying them in Photoshop. Now, uh, I realize that for many people, this may boil down to just how familiar and comfortable they are working in each program. So, for example, somebody may be relatively new to Lightroom, but have a fair amount of Photoshop experience under their belt, and it just may be uh, more comfortable for them to take an image into Photoshop and apply the adjustments there because they're very familiar with that workflow. They are familiar and comfortable with the, the terrain, the lay of the land, as it were, inside of Photoshop. Other people may just want to be uh, taking advantage of Lightroom for its, you know, catalog and image management capabilities and prefer making their adjustments in Photoshop. For me, I prefer to 
make as many adjustments as possible to my images in Lightroom before I take them into Photoshop. And if I do go into Photoshop, I'm doing so for pretty specific reasons. Um, I shoot raw most of the time, except for the, the JPEGs that are coming out of my iPhone. So it really makes sense for me to take advantage of the excellent raw processing capabilities that Lightroom has to offer. Uh, I do think that for most photographers, uh, Lightroom can um, address perhaps 85 to 95 percent, maybe even 100 percent of what they need to do to an image. So it has excellent uh, features and tools for applying global adjustments that affect the entire image, as well as more localized adjustments that are designed to target only specific parts of an image, such as darkening the sky or maybe lightening up the shadows on a subject's face, something like that. So I do choose to apply as much as possible to the image while it's in Lightroom. I think that that is the, the most efficient way to do so, uh, especially because Lightroom is non-destructive in the edits that it applies. It's very easy to undo things and change them. I can take advantage of things such as virtual copies and snapshots to keep track of you know, different interpretations of an image as I'm uh, getting to know it and working with it. And then when I do go into Photoshop, it is, as I mentioned before, for very specific reasons. Uh, and typically that boils down to something that I just cannot do in Lightroom and I have to bring it into Photoshop to apply a certain type of edit. So for instance, maybe I need to do some retouching in Photoshop that's just a little bit too complex for uh, Lightroom's retouching tools to handle. Or maybe I need to make a really precise mask to address a specific area of the image. And again, uh, what I can do in Photoshop is just a lot more than what I can get by with in Lightroom using the adjustment brush and the auto mask uh, capabilities that it offers. Uh, or maybe I need to remove something from the background of an image and reconstruct part of the background. Or perhaps I want to make a multiple image composite. All of those are reasons why I might choose to go into Photoshop. And I do prefer to do as much of my image adjustments as possible in Lightroom. So it helps to identify um, that central question or, or to identify your answer to that central question. When do I need to go into Photoshop versus, you know, staying in Lightroom? Because you should really only be going into Photoshop to apply things that you can't do in Lightroom or as I mentioned earlier, if you're just more familiar with doing something in Photoshop, then of course that might be a reason too. Now our first stop on our magical mystery tour of the Lightroom Photoshop connection is the external editing preferences dialog in Lightroom, which controls certain aspects of what the file you bring into Photoshop is like in terms of its format, its bit depth, and its color space. So let's dive into Lightroom and check that out right now. The external editing preferences are found in the regular preferences dialog in Lightroom. And on a Mac, you can find that under the Lightroom menu, under Preferences. And on a Windows machine, you'll find that under the Edit menu. So I'm here in the second tab over from the left for external editing. And this top section controls what happens to the file when it's brought into Photoshop. First choice is what the file format will be when you save the file. You can choose either PSD or TIFF. I'm going to choose TIFF for that. Next choice is the color space. So when you're working with a raw file, it doesn't really have a color space as such. And when you bring it into Photoshop, Lightroom will assign a color space to it. So I've chosen ProPhoto RGB here. That is the color space that offers the largest color gamut of any of the three that are here. Um, the size of the color gamut kind of is listed in uh, descending order from ProPhoto RGB to Adobe RGB and finally sRGB with the smallest color gamut. Now let me just sort of state here uh, before I go any further is that um, the ProPhoto RGB color space really is only appropriate for files that have started out life as a raw capture and that I'm bringing into Photoshop in the 16-bit space. It's really not appropriate for JPEG files that are already 8-bit files. So I don't use it, for instance, for my uh, JPEGs from my my iPhone. I have another setting for that and I'll get to that here in just a minute. I do choose to use uh, ProPhoto RGB because it just simply 
uh, preserves as much as uh, the information captured by my camera's image sensor as possible. However, it may not be appropriate for all purposes. Now, color spaces and bit depth and color gamuts and whatnot is an entirely different conversation. It's like a big rabbit hole we could get sucked into. So since this show is all about the Lightroom Photoshop connection, I'm not going to go into that in detail here, and perhaps we will cover that on a future episode of The Fix. So for bit depth, I'm going to choose 16 bits per component because, again, that is preserving uh, as much of the information as possible that my camera's image sensor captured. For resolution, I'm going to choose um, 240 just because that's what I like to print at to my inkjet printers. This really is just a convenient setting here. You could always change the resolution in Photoshop if you wanted to. And for compression on the file, I'm just going to choose none. Now, in the center section of this dialog, this is where you would set up uh, the configuration for an additional external editor. So this is where you would go if you wanted to set up something such as some of the NIC plugins for Lightroom, or uh, in my case, for instance, I have MechFun's Tonality Pro here. And then I also have this setting at the top, which is a custom set space that I have created for opening JPEGs as Adobe RGB files in 8-bit. And this is what I use when I want to open up my uh, JPEGs that are created by my iPhone. I don't use the regular uh, edit in Photoshop settings up here. I use this secondary one that I've created. And you can see down here that I have it set to TIFF, Adobe RGB, 8 bits, etc. Now down at the bottom is a way that you can modify the file name for files that make that trip into Photoshop. By default, Lightroom will append a dash and then the word edit onto the original file name and that's fine if, if you want to go with that I have changed mine to append a dash M onto the file name and for me M is just a, a long-term shorthand I've used for many years that denotes a master image a master image is a file that has made the trip into Photoshop and has had layers, adjustment layers, and layer masks added in the course of the editing. So I have mine set to add a dash M onto the file name. You can create your own file name template here just by opening this up and choosing edit and going into the file name template editor. All right, so those are the external editing preferences. It's important to just sort of take a glance at that and make sure that everything is set up the way that you want it and the way that makes sense for your own particular workflow. So for this file here, which was taken in Iceland uh, earlier this year in the winter, this is part of a winter landscapes workshop that I was doing, uh, I'm going to take this into Photoshop and I'm going to make a change that I can't really do uh, in Lightroom. So this is a raw file. I have applied some Lightroom adjustments to it. If I press the Y key on the keyboard, you can see what the original capture was like and what the adjusted version is like. I've chosen to darken it down significantly just to create uh, a little bit more of a gloomy, dark feel for it. So I'm going to go to the photo menu and I'm going to choose Edit in Adobe Photoshop CC 2015. Again, I could also use that shortcut of Command E. All right, so now we have the file in Photoshop. I'm just going to do this really quick here. I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm going to add a brand new layer in Photoshop. I'm going to use the rectangular marquee tool to create a rectangle that sort of comes right down to the edge of that crater. And maybe let's make it a little bit wider. And I'm going to fill that selection on this new empty layer with white. White happens to be my foreground color now, so I'm just going to use the shortcut of Option Delete on a Mac or Alt Delete, Alt Backspace, excuse me, on Windows to fill that with white, and I'll get rid of my selection by choosing Command D. So now what I want to do is modify this to create kind of more of a fan shape. So I'll choose Command T or Control T on Windows to get the free transform tool. And if I hold down Command Option Shift, that would be Control alt shift on Windows, I can grab a corner handle and kind of fan this out here. And I'll grab one of the lower corner handles and make that a little bit slimmer there. So we'll just sort of fan this out, something like this. So it's, it's going to look, when I'm done here, like there's this beam of light emanating from inside the crater. So we're kind of going for a science fiction feel here. 
And next what I'm going to do is just uh, apply a blurring filter. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And I'm not worried about doing this non-destructively by making the layer a smart object or anything like that. Uh, this is just a quick and dirty thing, mainly so we can really see that something has been done and changed to the image, okay? So something like that looks pretty good. All right, we'll say okay. And then I'm gonna change the blend mode for this layer to overlay, there we go. And that actually blends it a little bit better with the darker color underneath and it really kind of looks like this strange light emanating from the crater. So that's all I'm gonna do right now. I'm just gonna add that one layer. Let me just rename that layer, call it light beam. Now, to have this image so it shows up back in Lightroom, I just need to save it. Just do a regular save. I'm not gonna do a save as, and I'm not gonna give it another name. I will be covering the ramifications of that aspect of the Lightroom Photoshop connection a little bit later in the episode. So stay tuned for that because that is an important thing to, to understand about how uh, Lightroom and Photoshop work when you choose to do a save as. Right now I'm just going to uh, close the file and when it asks me to save it, I will choose to save it. So after we have brought the image into Photoshop, made our changes and saved it, the new file, that TIFF file that Lightroom created when it first brought the file into Photoshop, that has been saved and added back into the Lightroom catalog and placed next to the original image that we started out with. And you can see that here. If we go to the Lightroom catalog, you can see the, the new file with the mysterious beam of light there. And you can also see here that uh, the file name has that dash M extension, which is the way that I like to name my files that make that journey from Lightroom into Photoshop. Now at this point, we have the file back in Lightroom, so of course we could apply new Lightroom adjustments to the file. Um, maybe we want to make it black and white, maybe we decide we want to saturate the color or desaturate the color. Whatever the case may be, you may find yourself uh, contemplating an image and deciding to make some further tweaks and since the image is already here in Lightroom it kind of might make sense to you to make those changes there. However, once I have had a file make the journey into Photoshop and I've added Photoshop specific uh, attributes to the file such as layers, adjustment layers, layer mask, etc. Um, that really for me becomes kind of a, a fork in the image processing road. Because the way that Lightroom applies changes to images and the way that Photoshop applies changes to the images are two very different things. Uh, the programs play well together because they're both made by Adobe and they're designed to play well together. But uh, once you start making changes in one program and then decide you want to make further changes in another program, there's a little bit of a disconnect in which changes are going to be visible in which program. And so that is the uh, aspect of the Lightroom Photoshop connection that we are going to explore next. So what I'm going to do just to make this pretty clear and obvious is I am going to come into the Lightroom develop module and make some changes to this. I'm going to choose to make some really obvious changes just so that we can really see the difference and it's really plain and clear what's happening. So the first thing I think I'm going to do is um, make this image black and white just to give us a really obvious different change. I'll come down here to the black and white panel and let me just play around with the blue slider because there's obviously a lot of blue in this image. Something like that looks kind of interesting. Let me go to the tone curve and let me uh, apply a little bit more of a, of a contrasty tone curve. Our Polar Explorer is getting a little bit darker there, but that's fine because it, it provides a good contrast between um, him and the snowy landscape. Let me make that a little bit brighter there. Okay, something like that, just so that we've made a change. So now what I want to do is I want to bring this image back into Photoshop. So I'll use that shortcut that I mentioned earlier, which was Command E on a Mac or Control E on Windows. And then this dialog appears, the what to edit dialog. So we have three choices here 
and each one has a little bit of explanatory text underneath it. Let's look at the first one. Edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. And down below it says, apply the Lightroom adjustments to a copy of the file and edit that one. So right off the bat we know that it's going to make a new copy of the file. What it does not tell you here, and what is a critical piece of information that is missing from this explanation, it does not tell you that any layers you have added in Photoshop will be flattened in this copy file. So to me, that is very, very problematic because I always want to have access to the different layers that I've added in Photoshop just for the sake of workflow flexibility. But let's just click on edit here and choose that first choice, edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. And here it is in Photoshop. And if you look at my layers panel over here, you can see that there is no longer a layer, a separate layer, uh, for that beam of light coming out of the crater. So that is really not something that I want. Uh, I'm going to actually close this file and not save it. And let's go back to Lightroom. The primary reason why I don't want to use that approach is that I just do want to have access to my layers. Uh, it's very important to me to structure my edits so that I always have access to all the different things that I've done to them and that those edits are still flexible and I can go in and make changes, remove them, modify them as needed. The only time I might use this first choice here, the edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments choice, is if I wanted to take the image in an entirely different creative direction and I knew I didn't need to go backwards and preserve any of the flexibility. Uh, I tend to use this choice very, very rarely. Uh, the main thing to understand, as we just saw, is that any layers you've added in Photoshop will be flattened. Let's move on to the next choice here, the edit a copy choice. Here it says edit a copy of the original file. Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. Well, let's choose that and see what result we get. So here we are in Photoshop and it has indeed created a new copy of the file. Might be kind of hard for you to see that, but the file name is the original file name followed by dash M dash M. So it has created a new copy based on that original dash M layered TIFF file. And if you look at my layers panel, you can see that my layers are here and that separate layer for the light beam is there and I can edit it now if I want to. However, the Lightroom adjustments are not visible. So that is something to keep in mind there. It did tell us that ahead of time. So, you know, we did have truth in advertising on that front. I'm going to save this file. I'm going to close it and save it just to see how it looks once we get back into Lightroom. And then we'll explore the other option. So here are the three files that I've created so far. Uh, starting over here on the right side, this was the original raw file. The second file was our first foray into Photoshop. That was where I added the light beam coming out of the crater. And then once it was back in Lightroom, I chose to create a black and white version of this. So the black and white and the higher contrast adjustments are applied in Lightroom. Then I took this file and brought it back into Photoshop using the edit a copy option. Of course, with that option, it did preserve the layers, but it did not apply the Lightroom changes that I had here. So I get a copy of the file, but I don't have my Lightroom adjustments. So right there you can see a little bit of the disconnect between what's possible in terms of preserving Lightroom adjustments or preserving Photoshop adjustments. Let me come back to the file uh, that was the first file that I saved out of Photoshop, the one where I had added the beam of light coming out of the crater and where I also had then later added a black and white high contrast effect in Lightroom. I'm going to bring that back into Photoshop. Again, I'll use the shortcut of Command E on a Mac or Control E on Windows. And let's choose the third choice here, Edit Original. Now, here it says underneath, Edit the Original File. Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. Now, there's a problem with the nomenclature here, and I really wish that Adobe would change this because 
Nearly everybody I have spoken to about this, when I asked them how they would interpret the term original here, nearly everybody thinks that original refers to the original file that their camera created. That is, the original RAW file. That's what most people think. However, in this instance, Lightroom is referring to the original Photoshop edited file where I added the layer of the light beam coming out of the crater. That's the original it's referring to. So in this sense, it should say something different like edit original layered file or edit Photoshop or TIFF file, something like that. However, it does say that the Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. Well, let's just see what that looks like. So we're back in Photoshop now, and as, as advertised, the Lightroom adjustments are not visible. Now I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to make a copy of this light beam layer just by choosing Command-J on a Mac or Control-J on Windows. And I'm going to turn off the first light beam layer. I'm just going to use that kind of as a, a backup copy. I'm going to bring up my transform tools of Command-T on a Mac or Control-T on Windows. And I'm going to um, transform this light beam to where it's not quite so wide. So again, I'm holding down Command-Option-Shift on a Mac or Control-Alt-Shift on Windows and just manipulating these corner handles of the bounding box. So I'm going to make it more narrow so that we can really see the difference here. And let's just stretch that up like that. So something like that. And let's get the move tool and just sort of move it up. So we have something like that. Actually, let's flip it around and bring it up like that. There we go. That looks good. Now that really looks like something coming out of the, uh, the edge of the crater. That looks pretty cool. All right, so I've made a really obvious change here. I'm just going to close the file and I'll click Save and we'll head back over to Lightroom. So we're back in Lightroom now and check it out. The black and white adjustment that I'd earlier applied in Lightroom is showing up again. And that's really kind of interesting because the edit in Photoshop dialog, what it doesn't tell us is that when we choose edit original, Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. It's not telling us that, well, th those Lightroom adjustments not being visible, that's just temporary. You can do your edits in Photoshop and everything. You won't see the Lightroom adjustments. But once you save the file and come back into Lightroom, they're going to be reapplied. So that is pretty, pretty useful. Now, I must admit that this is the choice that I tend to use most of the time when I'm round tripping files back and forth between Lightroom and Photoshop. Because as I mentioned earlier, my aim is to try to preserve all of my edits in the most non-destructive, flexible way possible throughout the entire editing process. And that final choice, that edit original, Lightroom adjustments will not be visible, that is the choice that preserves my layers in the Photoshop file and preserves any Lightroom adjustments I may have applied to the file after it traveled from Photoshop back into Lightroom. And actually, I'm really liking the way that uh, this effect is looking here. Uh, maybe the, the light is a little bit too bright, but it's looking pretty cool. I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I'm feeling the story here that's being created by, by this image. It might be something I'll have to uh, to explore a little bit further. It started as a demo, but who knows where it may end up. So earlier in the podcast, I mentioned the importance when you have brought a file from Lightroom into Photoshop to just choose File Save or close the file and then click Save when it asks you if you want to save it and not to use File Save As and give the file a new name. And the reason for that is that if you do choose File Save As and give the file a new name, that kind of breaks the chain, that link between Lightroom and Photoshop. And Lightroom is not going to see that file anymore, and you're going to have to go hunting for it. So let's take a look at how that works. I'm going to choose the black and white image with the newly modified light beam there, the new and improved 
extraterrestrial paranormal light beam. And I'll just choose Command E to bring that into Photoshop. I am going to choose to edit the original. And what I'm going to do now, just so that we can obviously see that something very different is happening to the image, is I'm going to make a copy of this uh, modified light beam layer. Choose Command J on a Mac or Control J on Windows. And I'm going to move this over so it's coming out of this other crater in the background, uh, kind of over on the left side. And actually, let me just choose Command T on a Mac or Control T on Windows to modify this further. I'm going to make it narrower. And that's probably good, just so it, it looks a little bit different than the, uh, the first one. Okay, so that's fine. That looks pretty good. We were upping the uh, paranormal quotient here in this image. And I'm just going to choose to save as and spin off a new copy because, you know, maybe I might want to have two separate files since I'm taking this, this new version in a different direction. So I'll go up to the file menu and I'll choose save as. And it takes me back to the folder where this image originated from. So this is the uh, the folder uh, where all of the other images that I took in Iceland that day were. And I'm just going to call this, um, I'll add an underscore and then a V2 for version 2. So uh, one little note here, uh, kind of a, a quick power user tip. Uh, I never change the root structure of my file name. I always append new information onto it uh, based on what I'm doing. And that just helps keep things straight. Uh, it helps me always be able to track a file back to where the original image is. And I don't have to worry about many different versions of a file, all with different file names uh, scattered around my hard drive. So I'll click Save on that. And once it finishes saving, I will close the file, and then we'll head back into Lightroom. Okay, so we're back in Lightroom, and... Unlike our previous explorations in this podcast, the file that I just edited is AWOL. It's not showing up there at all. So what's happening? Well, as I mentioned before we did that, if you choose File Save As, it breaks that link with Lightroom. So Lightroom has lost track of that file. It has been saved. Photoshop did its part of the job. It saved the file in the folder uh, where all the rest of the images from this day are, but Lightroom does not see it. So we need to tell Lightroom, hey, there's this new file here in this folder. Can you bring it into the catalog for us? How do we do that? By synchronizing the folder. So to do that, I'm going to find the original folder where this came from. I'm going to right click on this center image here, and I'm just going to choose go to folder in library. Very useful shortcut there. Takes me right up to that folder. And let's make these thumbnails a bit smaller. All right, so there it is. I'm going to right click on that folder and I'm just going to choose Synchronize Folder. And you can see here in the Synchronize Folder dialog that pops up that it does see that there is one new photo. So I'm just going to click Synchronize and it's essentially going to import that picture into Lightroom. And here it is. Now, we're only seeing this one picture here right now because, as is Lightroom's usual protocol, uh, when you do an import, it switches to this temporary collection of the previous import, the most recent import. So if I want to get back and see uh, the rest of the pictures, I can just right-click on this, choose Go to Folder and Library, and there it is. Now, I want to add that to my collection that I've created for this demo purpose. So I'll just drag that over there. Now one thing you might have noticed is that the black and white Lightroom adjustment that was originally on this image that we used to spin off this other image is not showing up here. And again, that is because when we chose File Save As, we broke that connection back to Lightroom. And so if we wanted to apply that, we'd have to synchronize these two files. I'm actually just going to leave that in color because I'm, I'm kind of liking the way it's looking in color here. I'm going to go back to the develop module and I'm going to make a couple of changes here. I'm going to get the graduated tool and I'm going to lighten up the bottom part of this image so it's not quite so dark there. That looks pretty good. And then I'm just going to get the adjustment brush and I am going to paint on the 
jacket here of the Explorer, who is actually one of my fellow photographers on this workshop, uh, and lighten that up uh, a bit so it's not quite so dark there. Also, I really like the color contrast of the red of his parka there. So that looks pretty, pretty good. Lighten that up a little bit more and show my mask. And I'll come in here and holding down the Option key on Mac or the Alt key on Windows, I can subtract what's happening here with the mask. So I am painting around the outside of the parka here, wherever you see that, that red area extending beyond the parka, parka, I'm painting on that, holding down the Option key on Mac or the Alt key on Windows to subtract that area from the mask. Tap O again to turn that off, and then we'll see what that looks like. Yeah, there we go, that looks pretty good. Maybe it's a bit too bright, let me just back it off a little bit, and maybe just take the saturation down just a little bit. And I think that that looks pretty cool. By the way, I'm going to be returning to Iceland in mid-March of 2016 to lead another Winter Landscapes and Aurora's workshop. And if you're interested in getting the details on that, head over to my website, seanduggan.com, and there's a place on the homepage there where you can click to get more information. Of course, I can't promise you any wild paranormal occurrences like what we're seeing in this image, but cool winter landscapes and the possibility of amazing northern lights and auroras, that definitely is something that is a possibility. Okay, let's finish off by taking a quick look at some of the minor differences that occur when you're opening up a JPEG file from Lightroom into Photoshop. I already have a couple of JPEGs here, uh, and these are both from that same winter landscapes workshop in Iceland earlier this year. I'm going to choose this one of the waterfall on the left here. And let me just come to the develop module and show you that I already have added a minor change here. I've gone to the graduated filter and I have added a graduated filter that affects the top part of the image of the sky there. And that just darkens the sky and also the far mountains there. So that's the only change that is being applied to this image. Now, if I come up to the photo menu and I choose edit in, edit in Photoshop 2015, or use the shortcut of command E, what that's gonna do is it's gonna open it up using the settings that are associated with that preset. And those are settings that I established in the external editing preferences at the beginning of the podcast. So if you recall, my settings for sort of general edit, edits in Photoshop are to bring the file in as a 16-bit file in the Pro Photo RGB color space. And neither of those choices are particularly appropriate for an 8-bit JPEG file that was created by my iPhone. So instead, I'm going to open them up using this other custom external editing preset that I've created to open up JPEGs as 8-bit files in the Adobe RGB color space. And I get the same what to edit dialog that we've seen throughout this podcast. Now, one thing to point out is that this is a major difference between working with a raw file that you've applied Lightroom edits to and working with a JPEG that you've applied Lightroom edits to. When you open up a raw file, you don't see this little dialog. It just comes straight into Photoshop with the Lightroom adjustments visible. But if you're working with a non-RAW file, so a JPEG, a TIFF, a Photoshop file, things like that, you're always going to get this dialog here, which gives you these three choices. Now, in this case, I do not really want to edit the original because I'd like to keep my original capture kind of pristine and untouched. So I will choose to edit a copy with Lightroom Adjustments because I do want to edit the copy file and I do want Lightroom to apply the adjustments that I've already added to this image. So I'll click edit to bring that into Photoshop. Here it is. Let me just duplicate the background layer by choosing Command J on a Mac or Control J on Windows. And let me just make a change that's really easy to see. I'm gonna come down to the blur gallery and choose tilt shift. And we will add a, a gratuitous tilt shift effect here where we will blur the foreground somewhat. Maybe uh, bring that up so that the blur is really only applying kind of to the background a little bit. Something like that. 
um, mainly just so that we can really see quite clearly uh, what's being done to this image here in Photoshop. All right, so I'll just click OK to that, and here's that tilt shift effect there. And I'll just choose to close the file and click Save. So here we are back in Lightroom, and the file is not showing up. What's up with that? What's the deal? Well, the first thing is I am working in a collection here. Now, when I was working in the collection that had the raw images, if the image that I started out with was part of the collection, Lightroom added it back to that collection. It sort of made that assumption, which is a good assumption to make, that I would want that to be in the collection. However, when working with the JPEG, that did not happen. So I need to go to the original folder where this file is stored, and I bet I'll find my Photoshop modified file there. So again, the shortcut for that is if I right click on the center of that thumbnail, I can choose go to folder in library. And sure enough, here it is, and I can see that it has the dash M identifier. It's a TIFF file, and if I press E to view the larger version of the image, I can see that this is indeed the version that I just modified with the tilt shift filter in Photoshop. So that's one little difference there that you might run into that could be kind of be a little bit confusing. And also remember that if you do a file save as and modify the file name in any way, that will break the link with Lightroom and you'll have to go and synchronize the folder as I showed you earlier to get that modified file to show up in the Lightroom catalog. Well, that's all we have time for on this week's episode of The Fixed. There is, of course, a lot more to the Lightroom Photoshop connection, and I'll be covering additional aspects of that in future episodes. I hope that you enjoyed what I presented here today, and I hope that you found it useful, and that it'll make your own Lightroom Photoshop connection a smoother, faster, more efficient, and more productive pipeline between those two programs. If you did enjoy the episode, let us know by leaving a comment in the comment section below. And if you enjoy The Fix in general, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. We'd really appreciate that. Make sure you tune in every week to thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix. We have lots of great back episodes there you can check out with many interesting and knowledgeable digital imaging professionals who are showing a variety of Photoshop, Lightroom, and other software techniques. And also, make sure you check out all of the other podcasts that are available at thisweekinphoto.com. There are many really interesting shows to check out. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks for watching. Go forth and pixelate. <laughs>